recorded and will be available online later. So I hope you are all ready for a really interesting talk tonight. I have the very great pleasure of introducing you to our speaker today, Martin Cherry, librarian at the Museum of Freemasonry. And Martin will be giving us a talk about Benjamin Franklin and the other constitution. And we are very excited about this, Martin. So over to you. Hi, thank you all for coming. Tonight I'm going to be talking about one of the most treasured items in our collection, the first American edition of the Constitutions of the Freemasons, published in Philadelphia in 1734. However, before I talk about the book, I should introduce its printer and publisher. Benjamin Franklin is probably best known as one of the founding fathers of the United States of America. He signed both the Declaration of Independence in 1776 and the United States Constitutions in 1787. In fact, he was one of the five who drafted the Declaration of Independence, and as one of the de delegates for Pennsylvania, he was involved in the Constitutional Convention, which debated and agreed upon the Constitution that would eventually be drafted by James Madison. Franklin was the elder statesman of the Founding Fathers by some distance. Having been born in 1706, he was 81 years old at the signing of the Constitution. He lived a full and a productive life, which in the context of this talk, I can barely touch upon. Franklin made his fortune as a printer and publisher. In 1728, along with his business partner, Hugh Meredith, he purchased the Pennsylvania Gazette, which he quickly turned into a, the colony's most successful newspaper. This was shortly followed by an annual called Paul Richard's Almanac which at its peak had a circulation of over 10,000 readers. The poor Richard was Richard Saunders, Franklin's pseudonym, and he produced most of the copy for both publications. Franklin made so much money from producing the Gazette and Almanac that he retired from the day-to-day -day running of both in 1748 to concentrate on the pursuits that really interested him. Franklin became a Freemason in 1731 joining the St John's Lodge at the Sun Tavern in Philadelphia. We don't know why Franklin became a Freemason. The Pennsylvania Gazette had published an exposure of Masonic rituals just months before Franklin's initiation. And when he was 21 years old, he formed the Leather Apron Club, which discussed moral and philosophical issues. St John's Lodge was just a year old when Franklin was initiated, and it was hardly a hotbed of radical enlightenment thought. Its membership consisted of four bricklayers, a farmer, a lawyer, a sea captain and a merchant. By 1734, the lodge had moved to the nearby Tun Tavern, which was also the meeting place of the Provincial Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania under the Grand Lodge of England. In June 1734, the following short article was published in the Pennsylvania Gazette. Monday last, a Grand Lodge of the Ancient and Honourable Society of Free and Accepted Masons in this province was held at the Tun Tavern in Water Street, when Benjamin Franklin, being elected Grand Master for the year ensuing, appointed Mr John Crapp to be his deputy, and James Hamilton Esquire, and Thomas Hopkinson Gent were chosen wardens, after which a very elegant entertainment was provided, and the proprietor, the governor, and several other persons of distinction honoured the society with their presence. As well as reporting on his Masonic activities, Franklin also used the Gazette to write up scientific experiments that he conducted, notably on the nature of electricity. This included his kite in a thunderstorm experiment, which he explained in the Gazette. As soon as the thunder clouds come over the kite, the pointed wire will draw the electric fire from them and the kite with all the twine will be electrified and the loose filaments of the twine will stand out every way and be attracted by an approaching finger. And when the rain has wet the kite and twine so that it can conduct the electric fire freely, you will find it stream out plentifully from the key on the approach of your knuckle. At this key, the fire may be charged and from electric fire thus obtained, spirits may be kindled and all the electrical experiments be performed, which are usually done by the help of a rubbed glass globe or tube, and thereby the sameness of electrical matter 
with that of lightning completely demonstrated. The idea was to prove, prove the connection between lightning and electricity. His experiments drew the attention of the Royal Society in London, who awarded Franklin their prestigious Copley Medal in 1753. In 1757, he came to London as the colonial agent for Pennsylvania. Representing the colony in a long dispute with the Penn family, he stayed until 1762. He was back again in 1764, lobbying Parliament on behalf of the 13 colonies, opposing the hated Stamp Act of 1765. The Act imposed direct taxes on the colonies, including a ruling that printed materials in America could be produced on paper from London carrying a revenue stamp. The London visits helped radicalise Franklin's political views. In 1758, he was an occasional visitor to Sir Francis Dashwood's notorious Hellfire Club, whose membership included the radical politician and libertarian John Wilkes. He also joined a gentleman's club that he called the Honest Whigs, whose members were sympathetic to American independence. On the 17th of November, 1760, Franklin attended a meeting of the Grand Lodge of England, then meeting at the Anchor and Crown Tavern in the Strand. The official minutes record his name spelled with a Y and his rank as Provincial Grand Master of Pennsylvania, an office he'd last held in 1749. The other Franklin listed in the minutes was his illegitimate son, William, who was the Provincial Grand Secretary for Pennsylvania. The two later became estranged when William, a future governor of New Jersey, supported the Crown during the War of Independence. After the signing of the Declaration of Independence, the Colonial Congress, representing the 13 colonies, became the de facto American government in opposition to British rule. They dispatched Franklin to Paris in 1776 to act as their ambassador and to appeal for French military and financial support. The mission was a success. France entered the war in 1778, providing over 12,000 professional soldiers and the support of the French Navy. They also spent over 1 billion livres supporting the Colonial Congress. Franklin remained in Paris until 1785. Popular in French society, Franklin also became involved in French Freemasonry. He joined the radical Lodge de Nursois, Nine Sisters, under the Grand Orient of France. He served as its Honourable Master from 1779 to 1781. Other notable members of the Lodge included the American Naval Officer John Paul Jones, a cultist and supporter of American independence Antoine Court, lawyer and future revolutionary Camille de Moulin, balloonist Jacques Montgolfier, and doctor of oppo and opponent of capital punishment Joseph Guillotine, who is sadly best known for the execution method named after him. The lodge was very different from other lodges at the time, sorry. Its literary members were expected to produce papers on philosophy and to read to their fellows and musicians to perform. Franklin insisted in the initiation of the philosopher Voltaire, who'd been persuaded to join the lodge just before his death in 1778. Voltaire's embracing of Freemasonry was seen by the lodge as a symbol of its independence and willingness to embrace Enlightenment ideas. The initiation had been controversial because of Voltaire's opposition to organised religion, but he professed a belief in God as the great architect of the universe, which satisfied any sceptical members of the Nine Sisters Lodge. It was a very different lodge from the homely Philadelphian Lodge of St John that Franklin was initiated in, and arguably illustrated his progress in life from humble printer to internationally renowned scientist and statesman. Franklin returns to the United States, sorry, Franklin returned to America in time to add his input into the drafting of the Constitution and died in 1790. I've skipped many aspects of Franklin's life, including his inventions, from lightning rods to musical instruments to bifocal glasses, his time as postmaster of the United States, his later opposition to slavery and his family life to allow time to talk about the book. In May 1734, the Pennsylvania Gazette carried the following advert. Just published, the Constitutions of the Freemasons, containing the history, charges, 
regulations, etc., of that most ancient and right worshipful fraternity, London printed, reprinted by B. Franklin in the year of Masonry 5734, price stitched two shillings six, bound four shillings. As stated in the advert, his book was a reprint of a book published in London, The Constitutions of the Freemasons of 1723. This was the fledgling Grand Lodge of England's first rule book, compiled by the Reverend James Anderson. It's largely made up of a traditional history drawn from the legendary histories of the medieval stonemasons called the Old Charges, but it also contains the rules of the new Grand Lodge and some songs. It is headed by a beautifully um, engraved frontispiece by the engraver John Pine and a fawning dedication to the Duke of Montague, the first Grand Master of the United Grand Lodge, sorry, the Grand Lodge of England by the Reverend John Desagulier, who was one of the driving forces behind English Freemasonry in this period. Desagulier was a scientist and did much to promote Newtonian sciences. Like Franklin, he was awarded the prestigious Copley Medal by the Royal Society. Sadly, he died many years before Franklin made it to London. You can see from this image that Franklin's edition of the Constitutions had a title page, but no frontispiece. It may be that Franklin did not have access to an engraver or decided to keep the cost down by not employing one. Engraving was expensive and time consuming. At least two of the later English editions of the Constitutions were published without their frontispieces, which appeared two or three years later and had to be purchased separately. Comparing the Montague dedications in both editions, Anderson on the left and Franklin on the right, you can see how Franklin may do with movable type instead of engraved illustrations. Apart from this, it is a largely faithful reproduction. The biggest difference is in the songs. There were four songs in Anderson's original for the master, the wardens, fellow craft and entered apprentices. The master's song goes on forever and Anderson included some printed music to accompany it. This would have required an engraved plate rather than type, which would have been a problem for Franklin. His solution was to ignore the music completely and include a new song, imaginatively titled A New Song. This was the first time the song appeared in print, leading to speculation that Franklin wrote it. He does have form, he wrote and performed a song called Fair Venus Calls to the members of St John's Lodge in 1741. So, until proved otherwise, it's a good pet that he wrote this one. In 1971, the short article on the right appeared in the Transactions of Quattro Coronati Lodge. It's by an American author and Masonic book collector, Harold Voorhis. He studied Franklin's original records and accounts and was able to work out that Franklin had printed and sold just 127 copies of the book between August 19, 1734 and March 1735. Of these, he tracked down 17 that had survived into the 20th century and listed their locations. I won't list all 17 copies are located. Some belong to American Grand Lodges and other owners were universities, local historical societies and individuals. He mentioned two copies belonging to the Library of the United Grand Lodge of England. One, according to Voorhis, was the most perfect of all copies extant. It also had a pretty impressive provenance. Its original owner from 1734, Luke Vardy, wrote his name on several pages. He was the keeper of the Royal Exchange Tavern, Boston, the meeting place of another St John's Lodge. There's something about St John's and Freemasonry I might mention later which counted Vardy as a member. Joseph Green, a Boston wit and St John's brother of Vardy, wrote the following poem dedicated to a Luke Tardy in 1749. Where's honest Luke, that cook from London? For without Luke, the lodge is undone. Twas he who oft dispelled their sadness and filled the brethren's heart with gladness. For them, his ample bowls overflowed, his table groaned beneath its load, for them he stretched his utmost art, their honours grateful they impart. Luke in return is made a brother, as good and true as any other, but still though broke with Asian wine, 
he preserves the token and the sign. There's no record of what happened to Luke Hardy after this point, but in 1752, he passed the book to Henry Price. Price, a tailor and merchant, had been provincial grand master of New England from 1733 until 1737, and again for short periods in the 1740s, 1750s, and 1760s. He established lodges in Massachusetts and the six adjoining colonies, and as far afield as Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, and the West Indies. He owned the book for less than a year giving it to Jonathan Pugh, who was another St John's regular. We don't know who owns the book immediately after Pugh, but in 1821, someone called Richard Stute added his name. 49 years later, it belonged to Foster Green in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And from Green, it passed to another Portsmouth resident, Thomas Marvin, in 1895. Marvin was a member of, yes, you guessed it, St John's Lodge No. 1, under the Grand Lodge of New Hampshire. Another member of the Marvin family, the Reverend Johnson P. Marvin, was the next owner of the book. He didn't add a date, but he, he was a New Hampshire Freemason from 1901 before moving to Rochester, Vermont in 1920 and joining Rural Lodge number 29. In 1933, Marvin's widow sold the book to the Abraham, to, sorry, to um, Abraham Rosenbach for $500. Rosenbach, pictured on the left, also owned the only surviving copy of Franklin's Poor Richard's Almanac, which we saw earlier. He was a very successful antiquarian book dealer, known as the Terror of the Auction Room in London and the Napoleon of Books in Paris. He established the Fellowship of Bibliography at the University of Pennsylvania and willed his estate to the Rosenbach Foundation which established the Rosenbach Museum and Library. During his lifetime, he helped some of the most prestigious libraries in the United States build up their collections, including the Widener Library, Harvard, and the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, DC. So it is a little surprising he sold this copy of Franklin's Constitutions to an Englishman, Wallace Heaton, on the right. Heaton was a member of the United Grand Lodge of England's Board of General Purposes, from 1939 until 1952. He was an also an avid collector of Masonic books, a member of the Research Lodge Cotra Coronati, and the chair of Grand Lodge's Library and Arts Committee. Towards the end of his life, he presented some of his most important books to the Library Museum, as we were then called, and many others were acquired in a sale after his death. Our collection has over 260 books that used to belong to Wallace Heaton that contained his distinctive book plate. Our second copy of Franklin's Constitution also belonged to Wallace Heaton and was sold to him by Harold Voorhis in 1937. It's another good copy with the original binding, but without the impressive provenance. Franklin died in 1790, but his contribution to American Freemasonry like his contribution to American life has not been forgotten. There are a host of lodges named after him in the United States, including lodges in Indiana, Missouri, Nevada, Ohio, Wisconsin, and the District of Columbia, and abroad, including France, Germany, Italy, and Switzerland. This apron from our collection is for Benjamin Franklin Lodge number 134 in Philadelphia. It was founded in 1812. Its first master was Richard Franklin Back, who helped draft the Constitution of Texas and was Benjamin Franklin's grandson. Thank you very much for listening to this talk. I hope you enjoyed it. If anyone has any questions about Franklin's Freemasonry, his book of constitutions or anything else, please ask us via the chat button. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. Well done. Bravo. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Martin, will you uh, put the PowerPoint down so we can see oh. you? That would be lovely. <laughs> Perfect, thank you so much. As Martin said, if you have a question for him, please post it in the chat um, and we'll give you a bit of time to type. We appreciate uh, it, it takes a bit of time. Um, Martin, fantastic talk. Um, I was wondering, um, as a polymath and someone with a very scientific outlook, uh, Franklin, and clearly also someone who got his, his inspiration from many different sources, 
how did that um, impact his work on the Constitution and his, his life in Freemasonry? What, what's your impression on that? Um, well, I think, um, obviously, the, the first, the Franklin's edition of the Constitution is a, is a copy of the English, um, first edition of the English copy from 1723. Um, Franklin was interested in the sciences and, and the, the first edition of the, free, of the, of the Constitutions um, was published by um, a publisher called Hook and Senex, who in, in England at the time were mostly known for scientific publications. And many of the people involved in the early Grand Lodge of England were scientists. So um, Desigoulier, obviously he, he, he won the Copley Medal for three times for his um, lectures on Newtonian physics. And he also was a, um, a demonstrator at the Royal Society. There were other earlier members like the antiquarian, um, his name somewhere. Um, uh, Martin Foulkes was a um, mathematician who was involved. W William Stukeley, who was an antiquarian, was also an early, early Freemason. And um, a scientific instrument maker called Jonathan Sissons um, was also involved in the early years of Grand Lodge. And um, Duke of Richmond, who was Grand Master in 1724, also joined the Royal Society in 1724. So there, there's lots of early English scientists around around the formation of Freemasonry. And there's quite a strong evidence that um, Freemasons lodges in London um, had historic, had um, scientific lectures as part of the, of the process. There's a couple of lodges that we've got um, minute books in, in the collection where they talk about experiments or demonstrations that were being done. So that might have been part of the attraction of Freemasonry to, to Franklin. Yeah, I actually got a question to you about that, uh, Martin, uh, in the chat. Uh, was Rosenberg a Freemason or was his ownership of the book due to his antiquarian interests? Um, I've not been able to find Rosenberg listed as a Freemason. Um, I, I, have, I have, well, I'll have to write to the, or email the, um, the Grand Lodge of um, Philadelphia, because like, he's based in Philadelphia, so I'll, I'll email their um, librarian, but I haven't found any evidence that he was a Freemason. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, I suspect if he if he was a Freemason, he would have possibly given it to one of the Philadelphia and Masonic. Like, although the Grand Lodge of Philadelphia have got about three copies already in their in their library collection. Right. But I, I I just can't imagine an American Freemason given away or or not but sold for five hundred dollars the most prestigious American Masonic book that of its time. So yeah, I don't think he was. That is true. Um, what was the content of Franklin's reprint of, of the Constitution? Was it faithful to the to the English ed edition? Yeah, it's almost word for word faithful. So um, the only thing that's different is he's added an extra song, and it hasn't got the music. Um, so all the all the rest of it's fine. So it, it's it's definitely own, it it looks like it's actually everything about it's about English Freemasonry because the the the. Um, Franklin's Lodge at the time was an English lodge in America, so it, it's all about it. It's definitely English, and yeah. obviously dedications to Duke of Montague, who was the Grand Master of England. Franklin's Lodge would, would have been an English lodge right up until the, the Revolution. And you you mentioned the songs there, Martin, in the book. Can you tell us a bit about their significance? Why would yeah. You um, so English lodges and American lodges would have been the same. Um, met in um, taverns and coffee houses and possibly private houses. And in those days, the whole ceremony, everything was done in this upstairs room in a pub and it would have involved drinking and eating in the meal. There was no such thing as organs accompanying it. So they would have sang songs and um, it was all part of the process. It was all part of, I mean, Freemasons do still sing in their meetings, but these were very sort of rowdy, um, sort of more like pub songs than sort of more formal music that, that Freemasons would perform today. That's a lovely tradition though. <laughs> Is there a good general history of Benjamin Franklin that you could recommend? Oh, there's loads of books on Franklin. <laughs> That's a very um, good question. Someone email me about it um, and I'll recommend something that um, off my head, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, let me just have a look at the chat again. Is there any record or even intimidation as to where he could have obtained the 1723 constitution that he copied? I'd love to know. That's that, Somewhere out there, there must be the original 1723 constitutions that Anderson owned. Um, 
one of the things we're, we're about, like that they, they don't, we don't have, sorry, not, not, not Franklin, not Anderson. We've got Franklin's um, accounts exist, so we know how many copies he printed and sold. I don't think James Anderson's accounts exist, or in fact, or Hook and um, Tenix's accounts exist. So we don't know how many copies of the original 17 constitutions were sold and to who. So, um, but he must have owned, there must be somewhere in America, someone must have the book of constitutions that Franklin copied, which would be probably very valuable mm. and special book. Very interesting. Uh, I got another one for you here, Martin, a, a bit broader historically. Did Franklin's link with Freemasonry in England survive his endorsement of the American struggle for independence? Um, I think it probably did, because there was no, there was, there were, his, um, I mean, his, his Freemasonry continued um, up until his death, really. So there was, um, he wasn't ever, he wasn't, he wouldn't have been thrown out of, um, of English Freemason for his in involvement in the American War of Independence. There were um, Freemasons who fought on both sides of the independence who were um, obviously in English lodges, some of them were in Scottish lodges. Um, yeah, yeah. It, it would have, and, and, and even after the War of Independence, there is still correspondence between English, uh, the English Grand Lodges and their American lodges. So some of them write quite nicely to inform the Grand Lodge of England that we're now we're independent, we're setting up our own independent Grand Lodge. But after, in, in, um, after the union of the two Grand Lodges, all the American lodges were removed off the, for the list of lodges. But that was basically because Grand Lodge, the, the United Grand Lodge of England assumed that the American Grand Lodge, the American lodges will all become part of an independent Grand Lodges in the States. Mm. They weren't kicked out, they just assumed that they yeah. did that. <laughs> Um, were there ever any frontispiece or illustrations in American constitutions? Um, not Franklin's, but some of the later, most, um, a lot of the American lodges were, um, or ground lodges tended to come from the Scottish branch and they liked the constitutions of the ancient ground lodge, which was called a Heman Raison. And so a lot of the later, sort of the, the sort of later 18th century American constitutions or late early 19th century ones are um, editions of a Hema Maison. And they often copied the frontispieces of the original English versions of a Hema Maison. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Uh, was Franklin active in uh, the high degrees or side orders? Do we have a record of what else he was a member of beside the Craft Lodge? I think he was only in the craft. So um, it didn't, in, in England during that period, there wasn't the early, the early so when, when Franklin was initiated, that was all there was, there were only the craft degrees. Um, I don't, there was no, he, he didn't join anything else in England. He, he only visited Grand Lodge when he was in England, that was it, and that's once. Um, he is, I don't think he joined the high degrees, unless he did something in France, but I, I'm pretty certain the Lodge of the Nine Users only did the, or the lodge of the um, Nersoir only did three degrees in, in France. I think they're far too busy with the music and the philosophy and all that sort of yeah. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to do any other degrees. Um, oh, here's an interesting one. Was Franklin's, Franklin's son a Freemason, and on what point did they disagree um, uh, on American independence? Right, Frank, yeah, Franklin's son was definitely a Freemason because he, he's, um, in, in, in the slide I showed was, um, where uh, Franklin in London, it, there's a slide of him attending the um, the Grand Lodge of England, and on the list there's two Franklins listed. One was provincial Grand Master of um, Pennsylvania, and the second one was provincial Grand Secretary of Pennsylvania. And the second one was his his son um, William. So he he definitely was a Freemason. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know when they actually disagreed on the. I've not looked into Franklin's life too closely, I was more interested in the book, but they de his son became estranged because he carried on supporting the, 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 the royalist cause during the, the independence, possibly because he'd been given this governorship role in, in New Jersey. Uh -huh. Very interesting. Um, uh, and obviously, as you said, Martin, we can't go into his many interventions, but are there any of them that you want to mention or elaborate on in connection with your research specifically? Um, it's worth mentioning the, um, the, the the musical instrument he invented. It was a, a form of um, glass harmonica, it's called, and it, it was a, it's basically it was like a box with circular um, glass 
sort of tubes in which you sort of rub to make a sort of vibration sound uh, which was it's almost like it, it it's like the more sophisticated version of running your finger around a, a, the top of a wine glass or something which apparently Frank had heard someone doing in England but he, he, he took one step further and produced this sort of boxed instrument and um, it actually became quite popular so you, you have people like Mozart wrote music for it so Mozart was a it was also a Freemason um, he, he wrote music for it. I think Beethoven wrote some music for it as well. But Beethoven wasn't a Freemason. But uh, I mean, there are, there are the other versions of it that existed. But whether Frank can actually really invent it or just invented a different version of it, but it's quite nice that he wrote. So he, he created this instrument that Mozart wrote music for. Yeah. Oh, that's very interesting. Uh, do we know much about Franklin's 16 years spent in England apart from his political endeavours? Um, well, he obviously, did, I'm not sure how, how political the Hellfire Club was, but um, he, he was definitely a member of that. He, um, he attended um, Royal Society. He knew people like Dr. Johnson. He, he was friends with the Chevalier d'Eon, who was a French um, uh, well, spy and diplomat in London at the time. So he, he, he had quite a large social circle of people he was visiting and, and getting involved with. So. He kept himself busy. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> oh, here's a very specific one. Do you know of any correspondence between the second Duke of Richmond and Franklin concerning either of the constitutions? No. <laughs> there are some Richmond letters in, in fact, in, in the Royal Society, and some of them do relate to Freemasonry, and I think they're between Richmond and Martin Folks, who was also a member of the Royal Society. But I don't think they mention Franklin's constitutions. They might not have been aware they'd actually published it. Oh, that's right. That's right. Um, could Martin elaborate about why there are so many lodges named after St John's, please? Yeah, it's to do with um, in in the in the Freemasons' old charges, which are the the sort of legendary histories of the stonemasons, which the constitutions are supposed to be based on. There's lots of mentions of the. The, the two St. John's being the patron saints of Freemasonry, and that's St. John the Baptist and St. John the Evangelist. And um, so one of them's um, Saints Day is um, the summer solstice of the 24th of June, and the other one is, um, and I think it's St. John the Evangelist is the one that's in um, the December solstice. And significant things to Freemasonry supposedly happen on these days. So. Um, on St John the Baptist Day on 24th of June 1717 was supposed to be when the um, first Grand Lodge of England was formed. And then the other lodges, so the ancient Grand Lodge, which was the second Grand Lodge that came along in the 1750s, they used to um, elect their Grand Master on the 27th of December. And so, and so I think the Scottish lodges also did a lot on the 27th of December as well, so it's quite an important date for them. So a lodge is named themselves after St John. In fact, the, the United Grand Lodge of England, which was formed in um, 1813, the actual event that united two Grand Lodges that happened on St John the Baptist Day. So the St Johns have that sort of thing. That So lots of lodges really unoriginally named themselves St John's Lodges in the, in the 18th century, particularly in the United States for some reason. Okay, I see. Uh -huh. um... Martin, actually, how, how many of the founding fathers were Freemasons? Do we know? I've got some. I, I, I knew someone had asked that, so I, I, I did some checking. Ah, um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, so the, of the people who, um, who actually um, signed the Declaration of Independence, 16%, um, so nine out of 56 were Freemasons, which is actually quite a lot of of considering that there wouldn't have been that many Freemasons in America at the time, it seemed quite a lot of them were involved in the, the, um, the Declaration. The Constitutions, um, 13 out of 39, so that's 13, 33% um, signs the, um, signed the um, Constitution were Freemasons, which again, consider how many Freemasons were probably in the society at the time, that seems quite a lot. And generals in Washington's army, 46%, so 33 out of 74 were Freemasons. And of course, they were notable founding fathers who were Masons. So um, George Washington, um, the Marquis de Lafayette was a French Freemason. Um, John Hancock, who was the first person to sign the Declaration. Paul Revere, who wasn't that involved politically, but um, was the person who famously rode um, from Boston to Lexington to tell the locals that British were coming. 
he was um, he made some sonic jewels. In fact, some of the museums in the states have got jewels made by um, Paul Revere because he was a silversmith, and he engraved Grand Lodge certificates and was a later Grand Master of Massachusetts. Um, Robert Livingstone, um, who drafted the Constitution with Franklin, was a member of another St John's Lodge, this one in New York, and um, he was also a future Grand Master of, um, of New York. But um, Washington swore was sworn in as president on the Bible that belonged to St John's Lodge, which Livingston produced for the signing in. And um, the Grand Lodge of New York's Library Museum is named after Livingston. But then you've got other ones, like so you've got baddies as well, so, like Benedict Arnold, who fought for both sides in the war. He was also a Freemason, so yes. And some of the English generals were Freemasons um, and officers. That's a large number. Really. There are quite a few, yeah. yeah. Um, Martin, time is running, but I was wondering uh, here towards the end, um, in, in your research, have you come across any, um, maybe not new, but perhaps surprising perspectives of, of Franklin's life in Freemasonry, something that you want to mention? Um, I wish I knew more about the French bit, because um, I've got to say, we, we haven't got a very good history of the Nine Muses Lodge in our collection. It's basically a very short article in Quattro Carnati Lodge, and it sort of downplays any political aspects to the lodge, which I'm sure there were. And there's a French history that's about 10 pages long that was published in about 1895. And I, I just hope somewhere out there someone's going to write a, a history of, of the the, the, the Lodge de Nursoir because it had so many interesting people in and yeah. and it was a real it was it was a real melting pot of, of, of French um, radical thinking at the time and I thought that someone's got to write and, and there must be something on it in France and I, I, I don't know if it's minute books still exist but uh, I, I've got a feeling they do because I, I think I went to an exhibition at the um, Bibliothèque Nationale in in France a few years ago um, on French Freemasonry and I'm pretty certain there was a copy of the minutes of the lodge but I might be wrong but if, if there is please someone write a history of it because it, it must be really fascinating. <laughs> yes, oh good as me, yes. Uh, Martin, I've just got one more question in the chat, I'll just squeeze it in. Um, I, I'll read it out to you. I'm, I'm struck by how many Masons became postmasters and others who were involved in mints and printing, printing money. Perhaps Franklin served as an example. Do you know if these types of activities were common among Freemasons outside of the USA? Um, I think um, Freemasonry attracted uh, people who were um, in sort of very professional jobs so you do seem to get a lot of printers book deal or books um, book binders um are, i mean it, so you get a mixture of sort of um aristocrats intellectuals and professionals but also artisans becoming freemasons in the 18th century so i guess there's a good chance that you're going to pick up people who have those sort of professions Mm, that's very interesting. Well, I've not used postmasters and females, so it isn't something I've looked at. <laughs> oh, <laughs> specifically, no. Maybe I should. Thank you so much. Let me just answer this final question. Yes, the recording will be available to watch online later. Uh, we are running out of time, I'm afraid. I want to say thank you so much to Martin for a brilliant talk. I thank you for, uh, to Louise for technical support and for saving us tonight. And thank you to all of you for joining us and for your questions. I hope you found it interesting and that you may want to join us again because we will be back on Monday the 13th of July at 7.30 p.m. British time with Susan, our archivist and records manager at the Museum of Freemasonry, for a talk about Mini Windermere and the Freemasons War Hospital. So do join us for that. Please keep an eye out for the link to register. It will be available online very soon. So for now, thank you so much and have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you.